Welcome to another episode of Behind the Now. Today, I get to talk with the incredible screenwriter and producer, Jason Hellerman. Jason graduated from Penn State University in film production and English and holds an MFA in screenwriting and film theory from Boston University. His heartfelt screenplay, Shovel Buddies, made the top 10 of the annual blacklist and was purchased and produced by Awesomeness TV, starring Bella Thorne, Alex Neustetter, and Kian Lawley. It debuted at the South by Southwest Film Festival. Since then, Jason has worked on features and TV shows with producers and directors all over town and continues to look for offbeat and heartfelt stories to bring to the screen. Listen in to learn not only about Jason's own story, but also about his writing process and his angle and approach to storytelling. Hey, Jason. Thanks so much for coming on here with me today. I'm so excited to talk with you. This is really exciting. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, awesome. So Jason, you are a writer. First, before we get into like any specifics, what made you go go into entertainment at all and like get into writing? Was that? Yeah, just tell me kind of your <laughs> Yeah, that's such a good question. <laughs> I know. Um, you know, I, I always loved movies growing up, um, movies and TV. And I remember going to the library and my parents would be like, you can rent a movie here, but you have to like borrow a couple books and read those first. And then Um. you'd finish two books and you could watch one movie. And I just remember doing that growing up and just, I would read a lot, but always to facilitate watching something. Um, and I loved entertaining people and my whole family, everybody's taller than I am. So I think like, yeah, so I was always trying to get the attention. Um, (laughs) But honestly, like I went to college, I made it like one semester in like sports medicine and hated it. And, you know, I was like, that set seemed like a real job and a real career. But what I loved was taking film and TV courses and like actually watching movies and reading books about movies and doing stuff like that. So it kind of came naturally from there. I wound up taking a course at Penn State and where I went to college and the professor was like, you know, you're good at this. Why do you like, why is your major, you know, not this? And I was like, I didn't even know this is a thing people could do as a job. Um, and really I didn't look back after that. Uh, you know, I, I went to grad school at Boston university for screenwriting and film theory. And then I immediately moved to Hollywood and sort of very excitedly was like, I'm going to California. I'm going to like follow my dream and do this. So yeah, it felt, you know, maybe it felt natural at the time, but just looking back, it was like, yeah, I don't know. I loved movies and TV so much. I don't know why it never crossed my mind. And honestly, like, I don't know how you grew up, but this wasn't something like I don't have any family in the entertainment business. I didn't yeah, really know people. You obviously like, know the famous directors and stuff like that. But it wasn't until I was much older that I saw this as a, career, a viable career where you could make money yeah. and, you know, live somewhere else. So. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. So you did, uh, how were your parents with that? Like at the time? So you switched, I'm just like curious. So you switched yeah, no, from fair question. I think, uh, yeah. I think they've recently gotten over it. No, uh, recently. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, my parents were always one where we're like, look, if you're going to go to college, you're going to spend all this money. You should study something that you're interested in. Yeah. Do something you're interested in. Right. Um, I think the move from Philadelphia to Los Angeles, uh, obviously like very far away. We don't get to see each other as much. Those are the hard things, but I think what makes them happy is really like me pursuing something that I really believe in. Yeah. Uh, obviously like the Hollywood we inherited is so different than the one we thought we were going to get. Like I've been through the strike and COVID and yeah. just like uh, streaming wars and so many different changes and challenges that like the ups and downs, I think are something that neither of us really anticipated. Obviously like we knew it'd be hard work, but just like the existentialness of what you're dealing with yeah, totally. is certainly something else. But you know, I think they've enjoyed, uh, you know, getting to nerd out and, and hearing stories about being celebrities and all of the benefits. And and honestly, like, you know, like any parent would worry. I don't think anybody has had a hard, like an easy time in the past 10 years with the, the way uh-huh. the world's been. So, you know, it's I think the ups and downs, you know, there's certainly the worries or, you know, when you do free work or things don't pan out or mm-hmm. projects fall apart. Obviously, like, there's a lot of heartbreak in this, but. Um, I think they're, they're troopers. They're doing a good job, you know? Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. What it's worth. Yeah. Um, so when you first came, so you did undergrad and then you did an MFA in screenwriting. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so from there, then you moved to California. What did you kind of, I'm just like for listeners who are sure. in that boat right now and they want to do what you're doing. What did you do from there? Also, because you didn't know anyone in the industry. Yeah. Um, where um, did you start? 
Yeah, basically from there, I, I, when I went to Boston University. They have a program where it's like you come out here and you intern. So you had, I've oh, already fine. graduated. I have my MFA. Yeah. And they kind of basically steal your money. And I say that um, really be you that you steal, you stole money from me. But you yeah. pay like $15,000 to be an intern in LA. You take a couple like completely fake courses that aren't real you take one that's like <laughs> rewriting your own screenplay and the other one i can't remember it was okay. also dumb <laughs> um and then you know the way hollywood works back then you if you were getting college credit they didn't have to pay you as an intern so right. you, I know, so yeah. like i applied to be an intern at scott free so i got that job and then i also worked at mad men and it's like the writer's room intern so okay. like two great opportunities that i yeah. gave bu fifteen thousand dollars and got paid no money to do and took out massive student loans but uh i got very lucky in that scott free wound up hiring me as an assistant pretty much right away okay. so i stopped going to class uh left mad men just worked as an assistant which you know wound up being kind of an amazing, uh, just better than grad school could have been. Right. I was working in the industry at Scott free as an, so I started as a runner. So just like running all the errands for the assistants. Then I was covering phones and then eventually I wound up working for the president of Scott free on his desk and was his second assistant. And then he left and had a deal at Sony and I went with him and became his first assistant and then story editor Uh and creative executive. And that was over the course of like, I guess a year and a half. And during that, I was able to sit in on writing pitches and meet actual working writers who, right. you know, while they're waiting for my boss to get out of a meeting for their general meeting, I would just pepper with my own questions mm-hmm. and ask advice totally. and also get to hear pitches and hear yeah. some of like the greatest writers working in Hollywood pitching my boss, you know, it's so, like really fun experience, but that it was sort of kind of like a weirder trajectory, right? Cause the way B you would want you to do it is you come out, you're an intern, you go to these classes and then apply afterwards. And I just got lucky that, and I think part of it was getting my MFA. I was older, right? So like the assistants who were working at Scott free at the time, I was 23. They were also 23. So it wasn't like, mm-hmm. that wasn't like this 18 year old intern. I was like, I could go get beer. I remember that was like a huge thing. Yeah. It was like yeah. the assistants all wanted alcohol and the other interns were like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not 21. I can't buy it. And I was like, oh, I'll be, t- oh my God, they I'll be 20, 21. I'm 24. Like I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll go get it right now. Um, and that wound up being like, I could hang out with them. They would always be like, I'd pick up the six pack or whatever. They'd like, oh, you can stay after. Or they'd send me the liquor store. Yeah. Like, you have a drink with us. Things that like they knew they couldn't get in trouble for. Right. Um, and then I was able to parlay that and just do a job and uh, good connections that eventually, you know, when it came time for people to be like, well, what do you want to do with your life? And I'd always say writer, they'd be like, well, send me something when it's done. Right. So then you have all mm. these open doors. And I was yeah. very, again, like had timed it well, but also like had a couple scripts that I felt like were done. And I was confident enough in where when I could share them with people, if they liked them, they would start getting passed around. And that just eventually led to, yeah, uh, you know, finding yeah. my voice and also like finding the connections to help me, you know, become a professional writer later. Yeah, totally. So that's amazing because you, um, so like, cause a writer is on the creative side, but right away, like working as an assistant, you kind of got to see the process of like what happens after you're like by yourself or with the co-writer or whatever, like after you yeah. write it, you kind of see the process. So then you kind of have that in your head of like a direction that you have that you can envision your script to go in. Exactly. Yeah. Right? It, it, it demystifies. It was like people would make these promises and I'd be like, Oh, I heard my boss make these promises. They're not real. You know what I mean? I oh, knew what was a real thing. I knew what yeah. real attachments were when the money would actually come. Um, yeah. and look, I still like made lots of mistakes along the way, but I can't imagine doing it without working beforehand just because I felt like Hollywood is all about the naivete, right? It's like the glitz and glamour and whatever. And I had already seen the nuts and bolts, right? The underbelly, the like backdoor dealings being replaced from writing, like pitches that I thought were amazing. And my boss would tell me why he wouldn't hire those people. You know, like I really felt like I had my finger on the pulse that way. So that like, at least when I um, broke in, which when I initially broke in, I used this thing called the blacklist website, which is really yeah. big now, but at the time it was brand new. It had just come out in 2012. Okay. This was the summer of 2012. And I think I broke in and I was on the blacklist in 2013 with a script that people found on that website. And yeah. the way they found on the website was Franklin Leonard who ran, it was like, Hey, this website's brand new. We're going to start a script of the week thing. My script was on there and had been rated high. He was like, do you want to be our first script of the week? And I was like, yeah, I would love to. And then yeah. when that got email blasted to everybody in Hollywood, 
people knew who I was because I was an assistant yeah, for a year. Totally. I'd done a oh, bunch of drinks. So like they knew oh, you from being an assistant already. Exactly. All my friends were like, Oh my God, you're people so are saying smart. your script's amazing. I'll read it this weekend. I'll make my boss read it. And that sort of instantly yeah. gave me heat that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Right. Because I had put all the effort in, but I also knew which of those friends bosses could actually get the movie made or which mm. of those friends bosses they liked. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, hey, don't work with my boss. He sucks. You know, <laughs> like that. Sort yeah, of thing. yeah, totally. So, yeah. so that film you're talking about is Shovel Buddies. right? Correct. Yeah. OK, amazing. So, OK, I didn't realize that that was the beginning of the blacklist. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So before we go on, first explain, um, yeah. I'm sure you'll explain it like better. <laughs> sure. Um, what the blacklist exactly is. And then and then your process for being yeah. on there, because it's. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Great, yeah. So The Blacklist was created, I think, in like 2007. And this guy, Franklin Leonard, he can follow on social media. He basically uh, was an executive in Hollywood and was reading a lot of great scripts. And every year he'd get his friends together and be like, hey, what's the best thing you read? What should I have read? Mm -hmm. You know, and that became him emailing a lot of people being like, hey, send me your picks. You know, send me what you thought was great. Yeah. And then that eventually evolved into, hey, nominate a script. And I'm going to make a list at the end of the year. And I'm going to tell everybody what, what who voted on what. Right. So that was like early 2000s. I think it was 2007 um, that caught on and was very popular. Right. Huge mm -hmm. movies were on there. Uh, Imitation Game and I think like uh, Inglorious Bastards and, and lots of other you know famous movies. You can go on the website and check it out. Franklin, five ish years later, 2012, my time was like, hey, you know what we should have is a website. And on this website, I'll have people submit their scripts for a fee and if they submit their scripts, I'll have a professional reader who usually work for mm. a studio or like I was doing working for, uh, you know, a production arm of the studio at Scott Free, you know, which I think at the time had a deal at uh, Fox. Uh, yeah, I'll work for this, you know, I'll have readers read this, rate it one mm. through 10 on several things. And then I'll just have it on my website. I'll have an ongoing ranking of what's scoring high so that people can come on. Execs could be like, hey, I'd like to find a new voice. You know, and I think we all know Hollywood's not a meritocracy, but that was like a great way for him to kind of level the playing field. So no matter where you were living, you could be in, you know, Poughkeepsie or, you know, Baton Rouge or whatever. Yeah. You could put your thing in. And if it rated highly, it could be seen online. Yeah, it's so a brilliant concept. And, it's yeah, a great concept. Sense, totally. Yes. So it had just started, I think, the summer of 2012, maybe. Okay. Um, the website had debuted. And my boss, uh, Michael Costigan, great guy, uh, now runs J Jason Bateman's company at the time, was president of Scott Free, so Ridley Scott's company. He had a meeting with a writer, this guy named Justin Kramer, who had written uh, McCarthy, which is a biopic about Joseph McCarthy. It's an amazing yeah. script. And it was the first script that went on the Blacklist website and got traction. He got an agent and a manager out of it and, you know, a couple of writing deals. And Justin came in and he was my age and he was living, I think, at the time with his mom in New York. You know, mm -hmm. and I looked at him and I was like, this is ridiculous. If this guy could do it, why? I'm sitting in Hollywood. Like, how could I yeah. not do it? Uh, flash forward uh, a couple of last year, Justin was the best man in my wedding. So oh, it was also yeah. uh, uh, the beginning On of the a, a beautiful yeah. friendship. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah but uh, cool. and I love I love, uh, you know, calling him out for this because, you know, we both got the same boat. So I saw him and I was like, look, if this guy could do it, we're the same age, yeah. we're in our early 20s. He was younger than me. I found out later, uh, like why am I not trying this? So I uploaded yeah. uh, my script shovel buddies onto the website, I think in December of 2012. So again, very fresh. I immediately got a couple nines and a 10 on it, which was crazy, you know, out of 10. So super high yeah. shot to the top of the website, but it really took a full year. You know, at the time the website was oh, so new, uh -huh. I had some people reach out, but it was, wasn't like, um, again, like I would always just ask my boss, I'd be like, Hey, Michael, this person reached out to read my script. Are they, he'd be like, I've never heard of them. I'd be like, all right, um, well, it can't be that good. You know? <laughs> uh, and I also work with this other producer, Ben LeClaire, who produced American fiction this year and mm -hmm. a bunch of other big movies. And Ben was also kind of like a big older brother about, uh, you know, they were both very, I would say paternal, but they'd make them feel old, older brothery. You know, they'd be like, I don't know who that is. Yeah. Don't go with them, you know? whatever. So I would ride that out for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and then Franklin Leonard emailed me and said, we're doing this. Do you want to be the first script of the month? So that was in October of 2013. So okay. I had just continued to be an assistant, continued showing people my scripts, had a couple other scripts I'd written that I'd put on the Blacklist website, got notes on and was working on on the side. Okay. Um, October rolls around. The Blacklist website sent my script out at 10 in the morning. At 10, 15, I had maybe like 30 emails of people being oh like, oh, gosh. my God, by 11, my cell phone was ringing off the hook. And honestly, I didn't know why. 
Like I, it was something that was like, you're in the work day, right? It was a Tuesday. There's okay. so much to do. Um, and this was at the time in Hollywood, people remember who are listening. Um, I believe Judd Apatow had an assistant who had accidentally like CC'd a bunch of famous people. So everyone's <laughs> emails had gotten out. And at, okay. at Michael's company, I was known as the guy who definitely probably would have done that. You know, I was very clumsy. <laughs> I was always making a fool of myself in front of celebrities. Yeah, so I would fall fun. down. I'd spill coffee on myself. I'd run into glass doors because I was talking too much, you know, so like, Michael started getting these emails being like, yo, your assistant's on fire. This is crazy, blah, blah. And Michael was like, what's going on? And I truly, at the time, I'm not, I, I don't even mean to sound humble. I think I'm just stupid. I had no idea that it was the the website. And I was like, okay. maybe I screwed up. Like, I don't know. Oh, you were like, oh yeah. So he's God, like, come into my great. office. So then we, and yeah. then we finally picked up a phone call and it was from an agent who was like, I'm 30 pages in a shovel buddies. It's one of the best scripts I've ever read. Yeah. This is amazing. And then that's when I, I was like, oh, it's the script. It's this thing. And then I explained all <laughs> of what happened to Michael. And he was like, oh, so it's good. This is a good thing. So then we just, he very much again, him and Ben, I remember crowding around the phone. We were answering the phone. They were answering emails for me, CCing me on them. Like, you know, oh. we represent Jason right now. If you want to have a meeting with him, oh, you have to do wow. that. Time. You so were like, their assistant, right? Exactly. And then yeah. Cycling that happened. They just act as your reps. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In a very sweet way. Oh, so they helped right, me set right. up a bunch of agent and manager meetings, yeah. a lot of breakfasts before work or late, late drinks. They were like, Hey, you have to work here, you know, but yeah. you're going to meet them, meet them at this time. So, uh, you know, at the time I wound up getting agents and managers out of it, stayed working for Michael, I think into the following year. Um, okay. But that year at Christmas, that December, it was on the blacklist um, had gotten a bunch of votes. So what happened from the website was that I got agents and managers from there. Then those agents and managers sent the script all over Hollywood. Okay. And at the time, it was like this sort of hot spec. It's like Jason signed mm -hmm. with these people and things are going to change. And uh, then when it came time to vote for the blacklist at the end of that year, uh, it was on, it wound up being in the top 10, I think, and doing yeah. fairly well. So it was cool. Like you got, yeah, totally. So, so it was like a real rush from being an assistant to kind of being someone that amazing. was having See, it's uh, like on the other side of the meetings. Like, yeah, yeah, it's exactly. like the thing that, that one thing initially. Um, so those initial emails coming in, were those people wanting to rep you or to like produce it or like it was all a mixture of, of both? Okay. Yeah, all of the above. I think yeah. mostly it was just people being like, who are you? You know, like, okay. why, like, why is, why is everyone talking about the script? Why is it on my tracking board? Yeah. Or they were like, my friends were like, Hey, I'm, I work with Kate and Kate sent me this script, you know? And you're like, Oh yeah, I, Kate's amazing. You know, like just yeah. like your friends who have your back, who also were like, Hey, you, I've been telling you Jason's great for a long time and now read the script. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's so incredible to hear. I love that. Um, so in terms of, okay. So talk about, so shovel buddies specifically, cause it sure. is an incredible film. It's so good. It's Thank so you. well written. Like, yeah. um, I want to ask you about, Okay, carry on because you've already started with this. So how did that eventually end up getting made? Like, what was that process? Yeah, like? so I kind of worked for Michael then into March of whatever that is, 2014. Uh, uh -huh. And then it was like, you're getting so many meetings and we were trying to set this movie up and I mean with directors that it, I just felt like, and, and look, it was like a mutual thing. I was like, look, when you're an assistant, the best work you do is you're making sure things happen for your boss. Mm. And my whole world had shifted where I was making sure things were happening for me, you know? Yeah. And I was like, look, I don't want to get to the place where you're pissed at me because I'm not doing enough for you. Okay. And I, I was like, I could just see it happening. I was like, you know, you uh, I'm not, point. I'm not putting enough effort in. And, and I know this is a full-time job and it's a hard job too. Right. Yeah. It's a, um, and I think he and I, and, and Ben, we like genuinely really liked each other. And yeah. I was like, I just like, I don't want to waste your time or money, but also like, I just don't think I do a good job. So we kind of picked an end date. I set everything okay. up. He got another assistant who was there for a couple months. So like she had a good lay of the land. It wasn't, nobody's being left in the lurch. Then I kind of left there, worked some different part-time jobs, uh, just to like make sure I could pay my rent. And yeah. then it was like full-time meeting with directors and meeting with execs, trying to get this movie done. But uh, little did I know at the time, which it's just so much harder to get him. Even when you have a hot script, even when, mm -hmm. you know, I'm meeting with like humongous people and yeah. everyone's saying how great it is and you're pitching on movies. You don't just get money, right? You know, you have to wait. <laughs> so like I had the deal fall apart at some studios. I had okay. huge A-list actors who wanted to do it that then were like, ah, actually, never mind. And oh then things God. kind of quieted That's down. Crazy. So then suddenly in the summer, I was like an unemployed guy whose savings was ru were running out and I had no movie to do. So I wound up 
uh, just like working for the blacklist, reading scripts and writing coverage there. I was re- okay. reading and writing coverage for a bunch of different contests. Yeah. Uh, I got really lucky that Michael went, he moved to shoot a movie in Italy. So I got rid of my apartment. So I lived rent free and lived in his house all summer, like oh, watching yeah. it because uh-huh. uh, he took his whole family. So he was gone, like, let's say like May until September. So I was able to save a ton of money, not mm-hmm. paying rent in LA. So my cost of living went down. I was just reading scripts. Uh, and you know, at the time my agents and managers were just still pushing the script, still pushing it to people. I was still doing meetings. I was pitching on movies that weren't happening and I Mm. was maybe not doing the best pitches for movies that were. And you know, it's such a, it was such a learning curve, right? It was like, I I had like gotten education as an assistant, but I hadn't failed a lot on my own. And this was truly a summer of failing, you know, Uh, (laughs) fast forward again, just consistently doing meetings, the script fell apart at a couple different studios and and I was like really bummed. You know, you start with huge yeah, people sure. then you go all the way down and Thanksgiving rolls around and I just get like a call and I think it's like Thanksgiving Eve and it was awesomeness TV. And they were like, Hey, your manager sent us a script. This is the best script we've read. We want to make this movie. And I was like, okay, I'm like so used to things falling apart. Right. And I was like, <laughs> let me know. And they're like, no, like we're going to buy it. When are you come in? Like, we want to get on the phone with your lawyer. We're buying it. And then my lawyer called me. And he was like, hey, they made an offer. We're going to sell them the script. I was like, what? Like, what's happening? Yeah. Um, so I, like, went, had Thanksgiving at home, flew back. I think that whatever the Monday is after Thanksgiving, I was in a meeting with, like, 15 execs at Awesomeness TV and my whole team. And they had made an official offer. And we were negotiating. And, like... I think it all changed really in a night. And it was just, yeah. again, you need the right so person incredible. to read it at the right yeah. time. They had money at a universal deal. They wanted to make movies. They're looking to make a good s- script that was coming of age, but also like took some chances. But it's sort of yeah. like the perfect confluence of like what's happening and what was happening in the world at the time in, let's say like late 2014. So then by May of 2015, we had directors, we had a cast and we were shooting. And I think like that year was a whirlwind where like, then suddenly I had money in my bank account and I was like, great, let me pay off the credit cards I had to use all summer and (laughs) uh, pay now pay rent in an apartment, you know, because Michael is back. I have to move out like different things. So yeah, it really was that. So like, honestly, getting it made was just like my reps being persistent at the time. And also Uh I think like you take every meeting, you go in with uh, an open mind, you listen to the notes, you do whatever. And Awesomeness TV was like a really wonderful partner. I work with Brian Robbins there, who now is the you know, head of Paramount. And Matt Kaplan had just got hired and I wound up working with Matt la- last year on a movie. So like was able to maintain a really good relationship with him yeah. and, um, you know, was fun. So like Cyanad, these two commercial guys from uh, London were the directors we attached and then Bella Thorne, you know, humongous star, uh, at the time and, and still obviously, and, you know, yeah. awesome TV's whole thing was like, they wanted to get kids with social media influence sort of really ahead of the oh, curve with okay. that. So yeah, he and Lolly at the time, I think had like 7 million followers on oh, Snapchat or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, so they were pulling in people like that and then it was like, you're off making this movie. And I think for writers out there, you write scripts, you don't really, you know, like the, the most important thing or the most fun thing, obviously is seeing it come to life. When I wrote shovel buddies, which is a movie that takes place almost entirely in one night, I didn't realize, yeah. Oh, how do you shoot a movie that happens in one night? So I wound up being nocturnal for the months of May and June yeah. in oh, 2015. Yeah, Cause you're just like <laughs> up, you have to shoot. We started shooting at 6 PM yeah. and you just, and at 6 a.m. So you would just be there. I drive to set at like four o'clock and be there until, let's say, eight in the morning. And then you'd go home and pass yeah. out. And I had blackout curtains on my apartment. And, you know, you'd sleep until, let's say, two in the afternoon. Then you'd get up and brush your teeth and yeah. do whatever busy work you do. And then you'd be driving back to set. So that's such a, <laughs> yeah. that makes sense because most of it's like outside at night. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's no way to fake no. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So also once you, once you're like, we're buying this script, you still had, um, what's like your creative control, like your, um, sure, once yeah, one, at that point, cause it sounds yeah. like you were still, you went to set and everything it sounds like, or. Yeah. I think some of that was just like getting along well with the directors. Um, okay, you know, cool. I, like, like I was, my choice, you could, exactly. I wasn't yeah, paid awesome. any extra to be there. It was just like okay, the directors yeah, but, really liked me yeah. and they were like, we'd love you to be here. And I, I honestly wasn't sure how much I'd be on set. And I remember the second day I wasn't going to go. Cause I was like, Oh, I like, we were shooting, um, outdoors and in, in this like 
uh, clubhouse area was like a junkyard. And mm-hmm. I remember like we had a limit of how many people could be there. So I was like, oh, I'll just stay home that day. And I remember oh, the directors calling me being like, what time are you getting here? We, uh-huh. we want, we want you here every day. And I was like, oh, yeah. all right, I'll get in the car. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like when you sell something, you do lose control, right? Like it's not yours. Anymore. Like your you've, role is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You've, you are still there, right. And you want to help as much as you can. And for this movie, for Shovel Buddies, I was an executive producer on it as well. So I wanted to make sure, oh, like, okay. let I didn't me help out right and away. be part yeah, of that. But, totally. but it was also like, when you commit to a sale, like at any time you could be replaced, right? Like that's what writing in Hollywood is. And that's, uh, you know, I've been replaced since, but on a movie that was that small, right. Our budget was, you know, under 2 million. Uh, a lot of the time, I was like, every time I thought I'd be replaced, I was like, oh, they probably can't afford to, you know? And I think they're, you know, like it's Uh, expensive (laughs) to hire someone else and bring them in. So I was very lucky being part of that process and seeing it all the way through because it is, it costs money to do that stuff, you know? So, uh, and the directors were very open, you know, like I've worked with people on other projects since where like, I'm well aware, like they have their own vision. They want to do their own thing. Uh, Maybe they don't need me around as much. Totally fine. That's again, yeah, it's, it's part of the like business. It's a different project. Sure. Yeah, well, Shovel yeah. was so close to me and it was a story that was so personal. You know, I had a, a friend pass away when I was in college from leukemia and I just, mm. I, you know, thought he was a wonderful person. And it, so it was great to just be on set and, and feel like your story was being taken seriously. And also like they wanted your input, but also I was aware yeah. on set that like, yeah, we have to make changes. Like, you know, the original spec takes place in Philadelphia and it's a much bigger movie, but you know, when you have less money, like this takes place in the Valley and instead of it being mm. a professional sports team, it's a high school sports team. And um, that like the jerseys they're putting on. So it's like, it does, you make yeah. these little tweaks, but it's also uh, you know, and that was part of the deal, right? Doing a rewrite for them, working through things. But also, we didn't change that much from the original spec because not that much had to change. Um, I yeah. had maybe even accidentally written it in a way that was very makeable. Yeah, that's so amazing. So you you just said accidentally. You didn't like have that in mind, right? Like <laughs> no, when you write exactly. the original. Yeah, I okay. think when I wrote it, it was just like, let's just write a movie. And I think still when you're writing a spec, sometimes that's the best version to go in, at least for the first draft is like, just write the best version you can and then worry about the money later or the feasibility later. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So make it almost like the best reading experience. Well, like obviously it's a film, but like, yeah, um, I, but like don't worry about like budget. Like, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people that try like time the market. They're like, oh, well, I'm going to write a horror movie because that's what sells. It's like, okay, yeah. Yeah, but like the good ones sell. There's plenty of bad ones yeah, that don't sell. Yeah. You know, and I, I yeah. think like certainly look, if you write a, a spec, like a bit, you know, I think one of the other bigger specs I wrote was like this big Atlantis treasure hunt movie. It was like, yeah, it's really hard to make that movie because there's no version of that that doesn't cost a hundred million dollars. Oh, I see. You know, saying. like, yeah, yeah. So, like, I would think about it there, or at least know what you're doing there. But for me, when I wrote that, I was like, oh, I want to have a sample so I could pitch on bigger projects. I want people to know that I can handle those bigger set pieces. So like there was a use for it, the use maybe at the time. And still, you know, it was like, hey, we're not selling this or this is going to be hard to sell. Uh, but it got me meetings for bigger projects that I think wound up working out in my favor. Yeah. And also like you never know how hot as a screenwriter you're going to get. Like that's a spec that will never die. And I feel like every year I meet with a new director on it and someone tries to make it. So, you know, if you write a good movie, someone's going to try to make it, you know, or a great spec, yeah. they're going to come around. And even if it doesn't happen, um, you just want to be in on people's radar, right? Cause the majority of work is stuff people bring to you, not necessarily stuff you bring to them. So if you're on their radar and they remember you, things hopefully are going your direction. Yeah. Oh man. There's a lot of good stuff in there. So Um, Okay. So now going into the actual process of writing, what does that look like for you? Like to what extent do you follow like any specific beat sheet? You're probably way past that, but like, (laughs) no, no, I I don't know if I'll ever be past that. Um, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I am a really big fan of writing a treatment, right? So like a word, it's like a word document version of the story. Mine are usually between 10 and 15 pages were like single spaced word document. And I just Mm -hmm. write on the top, like opening scene. And that's, so I write, what's the opening scene? Mm-hmm. And I write act one. I fill in what happens in act one. I start with the characters, what they're going through. And I always say like, here's who they are at the beginning of the story. Right. Then I start act two. As we break into act two, this is what's happening. They're doing this. Yeah. Then I write midpoint colon at the midpoint. This happens. Then I write your paragraph after the midpoint. Then I say the, the low point is this. This is what the awful thing that happens. Yeah. Act three ending scene. And like, so I like build it like, and I write it like a big word document. So when you're reading it, you're reading a story, right? It's like, you know, like such and such character does this. Point. Yeah. And, and it should be, okay. I'm hoping like a page turner. People are like, yeah, oh, I want to know. I want to know this. Yeah. I try to put all the plant and payoffs in there and stuff like that. Then I trade that back and forth with my manager. 
and uh, I get notes, we talk about it, we change things. And, to, and then I get that to a version that I think is like airtight, you know, where mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, this is really in here. And all the details are in here. And I know what's happening in act two. It's not just like they have fun and games. It's like, <laughs> this happens, then this happens, then yeah. this happens, you know, so you're like, okay, great. I know what this is. Okay. Um, and then I take that and I open my final draft and I open the treatment next to it. And I just go back and forth. What am I writing now? Opening scene. I write the opening scene. Then I copy from the treatment. I just delete it. So now it's okay, gone. Yeah, yeah. And like I, I have to save there. somewhere, right? And then I just yeah. write back and forth and I just delete as I go until I have an empty document on this side and a yeah. full screenplay on this side. And then I, you know, get rid of this document and then I have the full script and then I do a read through and do a couple polishes. Yeah. And then I'll send it to my manager to be like, this is basically the story that was on, that was in the treatment. Right. And I get notes on that and get like, hey, now that I'm reading as a screenplay, it's too long or act mm. one is really boring and or we need to move some of these set pieces up, whatever they are. Then I start the rewriting process in that. But I, that's the way I've done it since the beginning, I guess. That's okay. how I did yeah, Shovel that's Buddies. Very and, interesting. That's yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, it sounds very organic because you kind of start with the story just like as a just like like a, the story without worrying yeah. about like dialogue you don't have any exactly of that. yeah i don't put yeah. real i really almost put no dialogue in that unless i think of like a really good unless, like, zinger comes, yeah exactly like okay, if there's yeah. something awesome that, or like a lot of times i'll write something where a character gives a speech like in shovel yeah. buddies you know um Bellathorne's character has this big speech towards the end and like that I had pretty much verbatim in the original treatment oh, where I was doing it from but like yeah so like that stuff that's like and that's an emotional speech that's the heart of the movie that's all she's talking about you know so like for me that yeah. was like the impetus of writing the whole thing was there but other than stuff like that which isn't in most things I write uh, there's no, no dialogue it's like you're reading a story or I like to think it's like it should read like a really good short story with maybe some dialogue but you're there with the characters uh -huh. and you can see them arc you know you're reading their arcs you're not like I'm not like just you know at the beginning he's a bad person at the end he's a good person it's like <laughs> you're reading what's building the arc and then yeah you know all those sorts of things yeah yeah that's okay and then do you tend to write like this is really just like specifics, but sure. do you write like same time every day, same spot, like give anything like that or not really? Yeah. I try to write in the same spot. Um, it's okay, in an not. ideal just... world, <laughs> well, yeah. I'll get, I get up early in the morning. I'll make my coffee, walk the dog, and then I'll sit and try to write till like noon. And if I could okay. put in like however many hours that winds up, whatever time I wake up, let's say Really, I could probably start writing around seven, seven thirty, and I'll try to write till like lunchtime. You know, okay. like what's yeah. like twelve thirty one in the afternoon, and then I'll do the busy work. But your schedule doesn't always necessitate that, right? It doesn't yeah, always yeah. work. So I try to be a little bit more flexible. I tend to rewrite at night, so like seven thirty at um, night when it's dark and yeah. things are done, and you know maybe my wife's in the other room watching Once Upon a Time. You know, I've got some time by myself. I'm like, all right, I'm going to sit here. And I'll rewrite. And that, yeah, I think a rewrite session for me is about three hours, right? So I start at page oh. one. I always start at page one. That's kind of the thing yeah, that I've, I've heard that before too, to always start from the beginning of it. Like yeah, you can't really I didn't, go like, I okay, didn't make it up. Here, I saw Eric, just... Eric Roth said he did that okay, in a YouTube video. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'll just okay. try doing that. So I always start at page one yeah. and about three hours I can get through 110 pages of okay. whatever. And look, you burn out towards the end. So then the next day you start yeah. at page one and suddenly you're at page 45 and haven't changed anything. Cause you're like, Oh, I like all this, but then right, the real right. work comes in, you know? So I, I yeah. try to do that at night. Um, but that's really it. Once I have a first draft, then it's, then things shift. Right. So then I'll be rewriting in the morning or doing whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. you know, that's, that's really, it's, I find that most people that are attempting to write a screenplay never get that first draft done. If you can get that yeah. first draft done, you are so far ahead of the game because so many people fail at, at like, the start of act two or in the middle of act two. They have no idea where yeah. they're going or what they're doing. That's why I really write a detailed treatment because then it's like I've already written a draft of the movie. Yeah. It's like, I feel like, oh, like, even though this has no dialogue in it, I really could just go back and forth, putting right. the different scenes in and get this done pretty quickly because I know how I know what's happening in this. Yeah. And then um, generally, I guess I guess you often have deadlines and stuff, but generally what's kind of the timeline just um, for like yeah. the treatment? If I'm and not like on a deadline, if it's just like a spec, I try to get everything I like. OK, so. I got my manager a treatment in December. He read it, gave me notes before break. I okay. had like, and we decided the treatment was finished. So now in January, my goal is to have something we could send out in March. Okay. So like, will this be ready by March? And really ideally, like just knowing the like feedback and drafts, 
maybe it's more like April or May just because other things will come up. But it's like I try to write two of those a year where it's like you've written two specs a year we could take out and do different things. And the years where like the first spec maybe gets made, then you slow down a lot because you're doing a lot of work. Working on the one. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, And then. So the process overall seems to be like writing, obviously, and then like back and forth with your manager specifically. And then once it's at a point, your manager and you like pitch it as much as possible to um, studios, production companies, directors, like all of the above. Exactly. Yeah. And and it's really like case by case. Right. So if it's like a popular genre, um, sometimes it's like, hey, like, let's just try to find a producer. We could pull it on it. Or like maybe this is like more actor driven. So you go to like the Ryan Reynolds type companies and Mm, you're like, hey, when do you want to do this? But if it's like um, I worked on this Charles Lindbergh movie last year, a couple of years ago that I was like super proud of. It's like that we're still like trying to find a filmmaker for, right? Because you need okay. someone who like wants to make a movie that takes place in the 1930s. Okay. You know? So it's like, yeah. how do we find the right filmmaker for this? And then we'll find who plays Lindbergh and it's about the yeah. kidnapping and okay. stuff like that. So it's like that sort of direction. But that's always done with a completed script. I found that like not many people really want to buy a treatment anymore. You know, that used to be a thing you could sell. And um hilariously i think i have weirdly maybe sold one in the past but like it doesn't ever happen so and i don't and don't ever anticipate it happening really again so a lot of it for me is just like getting it to the place where it's a a finished screenplay you know in in parentheses and then uh you know taking that out and finding people who are as passionate about it as i am and then hopefully getting it across the finish line because there's a lot of times where you get passionate producers of different things but people might change jobs or the the company changes demands or the covid happens right and you're like i didn't see this happening or a strike happens and (laughs) the power you know like different things change so yeah are you uh were you for that one at least or ever are you ever part of the casting process at all or no uh i so i'm working on this new movie that i'm doing with sylvester stallone's company and i'm like again producing that one as well and i'm definitely involved more involved in the casting in that just because uh i worked longer and doing whatever but when awesome tv bought shovel buddies they asked for my opinion but they also had like deals with kids that they were like they're doing stuff with bella thorne they're doing things so like i think i certainly made casting lists uh but at the end of the day like part of the deal which we had talked about when they went by it was like hey we know the right kids for this we know who's marketable we know how to mm. do this and yeah. some of it is just like when you're selling something and they want to do it it's like do you trust them and you let them go with it you know yeah, a exactly. lot of times for me now when i'm picking which producers to work with when we talk about casting i like to feel like our casting lists are aligned you know and it's not even them being like oh it should be margot robbie yeah of course it should be i would put her in anything <laughs> she's amazing <laughs> like i i would cast her as charles Lindbergh. you know like yeah, this yeah. is not like but it's also like it's not the first name on the list it's like the third or fourth where you're like oh that person's interesting you've thought about this and understand this and our ideas yeah. come across a little bit more like that yeah okay that's very cool that makes sense and then um and then like what makes you what determines whether or not you'll also be a producer on something or is that that's like, just that's how- my lawyer negotiating you know oh, a lot of it's like okay. if it's an original idea that i've come up with and we're trying to sell to someone then we yeah. always push for it because like I yeah, did all the work. Not? Yeah, for sure. I, I yeah. came, you know, this was nothing and I, it now it exists. So yeah. I which, and you basically like produced it. Also. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> so yeah. like look, it's producer. not always easy. And like people are always going back and forth on whether you should be or shouldn't be, but I always push for it because I also think like, yeah, I want to be there on the red carpet at the end of the day. If this gets made, yeah you know it came from nothing and i'm i birthed this thing it's the only Incredible. time uh, a guy can give birth you know so like yeah. let me let me at least be there for when it high, graduates high school you know yeah oh i love that and then so when you get an idea like when you're like oh i want to write this how do you determine the ones like that you should write that you want to write and yeah. how do you determine because i'm sure you have like ideas all the time right yeah um, so that's a great so question like, yeah. yeah back in the day <laughs> yeah i would just write anything i'd be like oh i'm passionate about this okay. if i knew and, and my rule was always like oh if i knew the ending i would start it you know oh, okay if i know rule. the way it ends then yeah. i'll start it and that's a good rule but i'm also a guy that i guy that um you're right about i have a lot of ideas so it's like what if i know the ending of five different ideas well, how <laughs> do i pick which one and that's when like reps come in handy right so i sit with my manager okay. his name's adam and i send him a bunch of log lines or even just okay. like paragraphs yeah. or even like beginnings of treatments mm-hmm. and i'm like i want here's i think before we decided on this one i'm working on now i sent him 17 log lines and, oh, I, and I literally was like, here are the log lines. And I'd write, it begins this way. 
And then it ends this way. So it's like, you know, it'd be like if it was saying Private Ryan, I'd be like, we're going to be on the beach and it's about this. They're going to get the guy back. And at the end, the big reveal is this and blah, blah. Mm. So like he has full context of what these ideas would be, you know. Um, So I sent him 17 of those. Way too many. But I always, you know, like he we have a relationship where he was like, give me all of them. Right. So then we go. You were all you'd be passionate about writing any of them at that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, And so I'm like. And and I put in order of my favorites too. So I'm like, look, this is my favorite. Okay. I'm aware it might not be as commercial as other ones. Sure. Um, okay. So then we just have a real frank conversation. And he's like, look, um, I was pitching this World War II idea for a while. And he was like, I don't, the problem isn't the idea. The problem is it's very, very hard to make a movie, period movie that's this expensive. World War II is like, I don't say like, it's not like we have a lot of those movies. So like what sets yeah. us apart? How, who are we going to find to make this? Like, there's like the, where's the appetite? I don't know. You know what I mean? I'm like, Oh, this okay. is a good yeah. point. So like, despite it being one of my favorite ones, we won't do that, you know, like, and then we whittle it down to like, okay, what are the commercial ones? Um, so then we had a top three and then he was like, out of the three, he told me which ones he liked the best in order. And out of the three, I, you know, and then he told me why. And then he also, we'll have notes on those ideas. So he's like, well, the reason I like this one better is because you can attack it from this angle. And it was an angle I hadn't thought of before that was really exciting to me. Mm. I was like, you in know what? In terms of, yeah. oh, in terms of like marketing, attack it from this angle, like, like, like marketing like storytelling. Like, like he was or, like, oh, no, story yeah, so he's like, like Hey, like standpoint. you said this was okay. the main character and you do it this way. But like, what if this was the main character and you did it oh, this I way? See. And I, I'm like, yeah, Oh, totally. like that's much yeah. more, in, you know? And he's like, yeah, that way you could have like Bradley yeah. Cooper, or Denzel Washington. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Like that, that makes more sense to me, you know, like yeah. doing it that way. So some of that's just like a dance. I didn't always do that. I've changed managers a couple of times. And sometimes when I get frustrated, I would just go off and write things. And I, I find that like, even though I could produce what would be um, some of my best writing going off and just being by myself and doing it, if you come back and your manager isn't passionate about it, then it would be very hard to get it out in the world and get it made because yeah, they'd be like, oh, I wish you'd consult me because I mm-hmm. would have told you it's really hard to make this movie. And I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, I get that it's hard, but I wrote a great one. You know, so it's like you're yeah. going back and forth on something. It's like him being like, it doesn't matter if it's great. Sometimes it matters if you can sell it and you already yeah, have a totally. sample that's like this. So I'm going to call people and tell them, here's a here's Jason. He hit another home mm. run of an unmakeable movie. And you're like, oh, I didn't think <laughs> about it that way. You are correct. Yeah. You know, like, so I try to now really involve my reps, not, not just like because I like, trust their taste. Yeah. But, but because I don't think he's ever going to be like, look, horror's in write a horror movie. It's mostly like, Hey, it's really hard to make this other thing right now. If you're as equally passionate about these two ideas, I would say do this like, one. Yeah. That and makes when sense. I was picking Adam to be my manager, a lot of it was like, I was like, look, sometimes I am going to have to go off and just write a Charles Lindbergh movie, even though you're like, this is crazy. Cause I just have to do it. And he was like, totally fair, but I'm, also going to tell you that like yeah you know, we'll, we'll live in the real world on it you know and i think like yeah, that Lindbergh totally. script is like one that you know he and i show people now that like maybe is some of my best just like pure writing you know it's a thriller about the kidnapping and um but it's also unmakeable like not unmakeable but like you need martin scorsese yeah, you know like okay. you need someone who can make a 95 million dollar movie that takes place in 1930 you know there's not that yeah. there's not that many people that want to make a movie like that um, so it's like, but it's great to have to show people, right? And, and to yeah, find stuff. Totally. So, yeah, totally. There's value in both, but it is cool to have a um, a manager that you collaborate like at that early stage because yeah, because the other side of that is like you don't want to just only be writing these things that like aren't going anywhere, but they're totally. like passionate about them because then you've invested all your time and energy. So you'd rather know from the get go sometimes. Yeah. Like, I mean, I burnt what, myself you know, out. You know, in the middle years, like look. 2013 to what is it now 2024 like it's 11 years of just writing uh, yeah. i've written probably like 25 feature specs some are good some are great some are bad but like in the middle ones when i was trying to figure out what i wanted to be or how i want what what kind of writer i wanted to be yeah. there were a lot of wasted great scripts right because i was putting a lot of effort into writing something great that was either unmakeable or didn't feel original or was whatever mm-hmm. and, and i do think like you i did need to find a manager who could corral me a little bit but also like one that i trusted their taste where it's like hey i'm not telling you to write something because it's commercial yeah, and marketable. It's like popular now. exactly sure. i'm telling you to write it because i think you're good at this or yeah. whatever and yeah when i was on the blacklist last year uh with this movie or script called himbo uh which mm-hmm. is like about yeah. a bisexual male stripper who is having an affair with his boss and his boss's wife at the same time and deciding which one he wants to kill to uh-huh. see like to like yeah, be, so it could be the, yeah. yeah and like that is a wild idea that like when Adam read it and I needed a manager at the time, he, we sat and had a real conversation where he was like, 
this shouldn't be marketable, but I think it is. And here's why. And I think you have like good mm. marketable instincts with four like ideas that seem like they wouldn't be, you know, and, and I thought yeah. I was like, oh, great. That's I just need someone to understand that. And also he gave me both barrels on a couple other ideas that he was like, don't write this. Don't show people this like this isn't who you are. So like, don't be that person. Be this. Uh, other. And I was like, oh, yeah, like that helped. And I think like getting that tough love is something as a younger writer. I don't know if I would have been as responsive to because you're uh-huh. like, no, I want to write this thing. I want to chase this idea. <laughs> yeah. I have to do it with him. It's like, OK, if you have to do it, I'll always support you if you have to do it. But yeah. also like you know, don't, don't write a roadblock for yourself. You know, if it's yeah, like, you've got to do whatever. Totally. And, yeah. Yeah. It's, that's great. Sounds like such a good relationship. Like so collaborative. Yeah, and Look, it takes, it's hard. This is my third, my that. third manager. Yeah. You know, I had, <laughs> yeah, totally. uh, I had people in 2013 who were lovely, but both of them left the industry. They were just oh, like, Oh, we don't want to do this anymore. And then I remember being high and dry. And then I was at a big company <laughs> with someone and it worked out really well for a couple of years, but like, he grew a lot faster than I did. And, uh, his clients wound up specializing in stuff that I wasn't doing. And it was just mm-hmm. also very hard, you know, or it's just like, yeah. Hey, we mutually loved and respect each other and decide like, Hey, I can't help you anymore. And you know, I and yeah. then look, and now I had to find someone else. It's just like, this is the wave of Hollywood, right? You're yeah, just always totally. doing this different stuff. It's like stuff. a process of like this big mess, but then yeah, like, but that's why you always have to be like, writing. Like if I had only yeah. written shovel buddies and was just like pitching on other ideas, I wouldn't have a career right now. You know, you always yeah. have to have a new spec or be working on something because people always want to know like, what have you done lately? Like shovel buddies mm. was in 2013. And despite people telling me it was a great script or like one of the best scripts they had read, 11 years later, they want to read something else, you yeah, know, like, yeah. they, or they've already read it. Hey, what else do you have for me? That movie was made. Yeah. What else can we do together? You know? So it's always yeah, constantly having totally. something new to talk about and something I think like you shovel buddies, a coming of age story. That was like a teen thing. It's, I don't know that I would have been the no brainer to write a Charles Lindbergh movie, but like for me, it was like, yeah, I'm, I need to go do that. Cause you need to prove to people that I can do it so that my manager now, when people are looking for prestige, whatever mm. can say, have you read Jason sample yeah. for that? You know, same deal with like some of these action movies I've been working on lately. It's like flexing a different muscle, but also like figuring out what my brand is like, what, like, how are we pitching me to different people? Yeah. You know? How do you, um, I mean, this is like a whole other thing, but how do you kind of um, cause it sounds like you write like in like across the genres now, right? Yeah, like you could yeah. do, sure. um, how is, is that something you like learn? Like, do you just have a feel? How do you do that? Cause you have like your natural <laughs> yeah. stories, like the natural ones that you like yeah. shovel buddies was like very, um, close to you. It sounded yeah, like, absolutely, right. Yeah. Um, so now, but like, obviously you've expanded to things you don't have like experience with necessarily, yes. you know, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, like, what's yeah. that like? Like, how do you, yeah. I think a lot of it is like, look, um, I don't know if I'd recommend it for anyone re- starting out because I think at the end of the day, you really want to set in Hollywood's eyes who you are and what you can yeah. do well. Okay. Uh, for me, coming of age movies about teenagers, just Hollywood wasn't making a lot of those. And I figured that out real quick. And I was okay. like, oh, th- I can't, I don't know if I could brand myself this way. Cause I'm, I'm not going to write the fault in our stars, even though I love that movie. Like I'm not John green. Right. So like, if I'm not John green, I don't know how to come back into like this. So I need to establish myself with something else. So what else okay. do I love? What else do I love watching? Yeah. And I love like Indiana Jones movies and I love thrillers and I, I do love like car comedy. And, you know, so for me, it was sitting down and saying like, okay, well, these are a lot of different genres, but what makes them Jason Hellerman movies, right? Mm. Like what, what makes what I'm doing about it? So it's finding a personal slant on all of them. You know, so for yeah. the next thing I wrote, like, a, were like different specs coming in and out, like Himbo was just about how hard it is in Hollywood for a writer. You know, it's like you're constantly dancing for your food. And I was like, well, who else is dancing for the food? A stripper, you know, like, so I was like, this should be yeah. about a male stripper. Oh, so it's man, like, I love hearing this. Yeah, which yeah. is like dumb. Like, but it was like, I was so tired of telling people, like, I feel like a stripper up here on the stage doing this. And I was yeah. like, I should just write this. Uh-huh. So it's like about a stripper who really doesn't want a lot of stuff. He just wants like a white picket fence and like a, a, a little house where he can raise his family. And he's like, I'll do whatever it takes. So that's all mm-hmm. I want. It's not like a crazy American dream. I don't want to get rich. And then, you know, he's stripping for it. Can't figure that out. So then he's like, what else could I be doing? You know, like, mm-hmm. is there another way out to do this? And then, you know, life of crime happens. So it's, yeah. so it's that sort of thing. Even like the Lindbergh thing, like, look, I don't have a kid that's been kidnapped or anything like that. But for me, like that's a movie that was about, uh, I wrote it during COVID and it was really just about like Donald Trump and like Charles Lindbergh was pretty much the Donald Trump of his day. He was like famous for doing something that like, I don't know, being, he was very rich. He was like 
blustery. He would get on the news and like kind of shit on the president. And you'd be like, what is this guy doing? But like, but there was a certain huge part of America that loved him um, for the wrong reasons. And then when someone kidnapped his kid, I think everyone felt really bad about it. I was like, you know, I, I thought it was such a fascinating story. Yeah. Cause I, I would fluctuate with like how frustrated I was during COVID about the way the world was. And also, but like, <laughs> I also like don't want anyone to die. You know what I mean? Like I was like, I like hate Donald Trump, but like when he got COVID, I was like, it would be funny if he died, but like, it wouldn't be great for us if he died, you know, like, I, I don't know. Like it was just like these, these feelings you have just being locked in and doing whatever. Mm. And, uh, the Lindbergh kidnapping is really weird because what happened was this random high school teacher wound up being the guy who negotiated with the kidnappers because he wrote a letter to the like an op-ed that was like, hey, I think I could get the baby back. And the kidnappers contacted him. So I wrote a movie about that. But like I kept thinking like, that's so nuts. Like we're all out here. I'm just like out here tweeting about like what the president should do during COVID. I have no experience. I don't really <laughs> know anything. I just think he's a bad person. Like, And it'd be like if someone handed over the keys to you, to be like, okay, you do it. You know, and I just thought that yeah it's such a like terrifying aspect but like also you'd have to step up and try your best you know and and in that one spoiler alert, like the baby doesn't make it so it's like this guy does his best but also like it doesn't ma- wind up mattering mm-hmm. you know so i like i don't know those are a lot of conflicting things but like yeah i try t- to go th- go through these weird emotions or like what am i dealing with how does yeah. this affect yeah. me you know um so yeah 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 what's really cool is like with the stripper analogy like for that yeah. film um it sounds like because this is kind of like acting, like I guess all these creative things, it's like no matter how far fetched, like far from you, something yeah. can seem, it's like really there's like the universal truth to it that you've like picked up on or like the personal thing. Like there's something that you relate to that lets you write that thing. You yes, know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, that's the best way. I you feel like I really rambled emotionally. there. Yeah, you have to yeah, find a, yeah. like a personal yeah. hook, you know? And, and for me, it's totally. like, it's not just a story. Sometimes there's a great story, but it's like, why do I personally care like, why about me? this thing? Like, why, yeah, yeah. Like how yeah. you said, like my your angle on it like because all these genres all these things everything's yeah. like been done everything exists right. but it's like what's the jason hellerman version of yeah, this you are like branding yourself, cool. right? yeah yeah and i think when my manager wants to pitch this to stuff it's like jason's take on this and it's like yeah. when you have a unique oh, point of so view cool. like then you and, and and i think everyone has their own unique point of view. i don't think it's just me i think like we can right, have, right. Like, i want to hear like what's jenna's point of view on this you know and then like yeah. how do you spin it that way like that's really where all of your writing should come from it doesn't really matter what it's about like like that should yeah. be like the direction of it. And, th- and that way, like when you've met an exec on a couple of different projects, they know your voice, they know where you're coming from. When mm-hmm. they hear Jason wrote a stripper movie, they're like, I got to check that out. Yeah. You know, because when Shovel Buddies went around, nobody knew who I was. Right. So the only like, thing they uh-huh. had to like they knew about was like, hey, it's about kids in high school and their friend has cancer. And people are like, oh, I've heard that before. That's dumb. Oh, but in this one, he's already dead and they steal his body. And people are like, all right, I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah. Right? It's That's so like, a like it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, um, it has like such a genuine, real feel to it. Like it yeah. just feels like a very specific lived in story, you know, like, you yeah, just, exactly. So yeah. then it's like, you know, like the burden for me then was like, okay, how do I live in the rest of these sc- stories? You know, mm-hmm. like if you write something great, how do I like continue to keep up with people and, and yeah. what it's about, you know, I worked with a couple friends on this movie that wound up not happening that we're trying to bring back around called chaperones. And it was just about the idea of like, um, I was volunteering out here for young storytellers, which is like you go into school and teach uh, fifth graders how to write screenplays and it's amazing and beautiful, but you feel old. Right. And you're also like, wow, the dreams you're having and your imagination is so contagious, but also like, I like kept thinking in the real, like the real world's going to crush you guys. And it's so hard. And I like <laughs> believe in you and chaperone was a script that I came up with while I was doing that, which is just about two uh, high school teachers chaperoning a prom and mm. uh, where like scream happens, you know? So it's mm. like, Hey, we're at prom. And it's like, is their whole life ahead of them? What is that? And it's sort of like a reaction yeah. I guess, in my mind to like a high school students have to deal with pretty awful things nowadays, yeah. right? With mass shootings and the way the world is. So it's like that sort of thing, but also like being in my late thirties and looking at people who were in high school at the time, my, my, one of my youngest cousins was still in, she was a senior in high school when I wrote that. And I just remember being like, God, your whole life's ahead of you. And you think you're so upset about everything, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm mad at so my true. boyfriend and I'm mad at this and I'm mad at the world. I'm like, yes, I'm also mad at a lot of these things, but like, you got to compartmentalize, you got to figure this yeah. out. And like <laughs> your major and where you're going to school isn't going to change everything. Yeah, you know? so it's like, yeah. And you like, know, like you can, yeah. it's weird because like, yeah, cause you have to be sensitive to what they're experiencing and Exactly. And you yeah, know, so like, the signi- yeah. like, you know, they'll get through it, but like, you can't yeah. just be like, 
Right. Get over it. It'll be fine. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> I was like, hey, look, yeah. yeah, so you're spot on. But then I was like, well, what if I wrote a script about what if you didn't know they were going to get through it? Because someone's going around yeah. chopping people up and, you know, yeah, so it's like, so it's like, that's kind of like yeah. the riff on it, you know, of like, okay, like, well, that's what this is. And then how do you deal with it? And how do you do yeah. stuff? So it's like, what I, like, I try to like bring that personal thing to everything for better or worse. Right. Sometimes people are like, man, I read this script and I know a lot about you now, you know, <laughs> like about yeah. your worries Which or is, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And that's but, a really good sign that's something to remember like if it's yeah. revealing there's some truth there you know like there's yeah like i there. think like when we send out a spec i you know probably vomit but like i just am so always so nervous when my mm. friends read it when whatever because i was like oh they're gonna fully understand what i'm going through and how yeah. lonely things are you know and even with the yeah. Lindbergh thing i remember it's like about like a guy who really wants to be famous and then gets famous and then it's like oh it's pretty awful and among other things and i remember my friends being like oh is this what you feel like like you want to be a famous writer and then you're afraid if you become famous you'll fuck up so bad that like the proverbial baby will be dead you know i'm like mm. yeah it is like that's how i feel i'm terrified <laughs> all the time but but also but i want it right and i want it yeah. because i want to be able to tell my stories i want to have some power in Hollywood to to reveal these things and do different yeah. things and you know I remember uh, when I got married that year I wrote this script called Chuck Mary Kill and it was about uh, a guy who wants to ask his uh, father-in-law kind of like meet the parents like not permission but like hey I'm gonna propose your daughter okay. and he finds out that that guy is a serial killer <sighs> and and he's like trying to relate with him on different levels and for yeah. me it wasn't about my father-in-law it was like like the nicest guy like but it was yeah. about like me dealing with my own masculinity and it's like you know you have the a grandfather character in that who would remind you of like Clint Eastwood right where he's like you're like oh like uh, not everything you say is okay you know like some of the stuff like the world's yeah. gone but some of it you're like oh toughen up Nancy you know you're like all right we don't say it that way but like maybe he is right you do need to be tougher but then it's like that generational thing of like you're talking to the father-in-law who's a serial killer and and it's like oh I don't want to become like you you know <laughs> like I don't yeah. I also don't want to have that level of masculinity but I do want to be this level you know so it's like not yeah. everything I'm doing is inherently correct either you know you, you always think like well, what's the next generation going to say and, and yeah. that for me was just like the idea of like I never really felt like an adult until it was like time to get married and I was like oh this is like yeah, a real just, adult thing like I'm just yeah. a what are you talking about? I'm just a 37 year old kid you know like yeah, hopping yeah. around here meeting people so like dealing with those things putting it on paper outlining writing the treatment getting pretty revealing about what that is you know like pulling quotes from real life working yeah. on different stuff and and then also like being okay sending that out meeting with people and saying like this is what I believe in because I do think the scripts, at least when I was an assistant, that I would pass up to my boss and be like, hey, the, you got to work on this one. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that I was like, man, I like understand what someone's going through in this, yeah. you know, like it's it's either like so funny, but also like so touching or, right. you know, or it's like so frustrating or whatever, or, like the books we'd read. I remember I read this great book by this guy, Dave Iserson, wrote this book called Firecracker. And it was about this girl in high school who like was like pranking people and whatever, but like she really had like some like deep seated connecting issues that like weren't out. Th and I was like, like mm. she didn't fit in. She had these issues, like these pranks were everything to her. Like, I was like, this is a really funny book, but this is like about some, I was like, I really feel yeah. like I'm reading someone's diary in this. And it's like great. And, and I'm, we also, Michael produced Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil and Vile, which is like about Ted Bundy and you don't want to connect with that character. But I was like, oh, I like understand what the writer Michael Worry was right. doing. Like, this is such a good juxtaposition of you're feeling guilty about what's happening to this guy. And then the guy turns out to be Ted Bundy. Yeah. And then you are sort of like, oh my God, like empathy, but also like he's doing awful things. And yeah. you can't shake that like in the beginning of that script, at least you feel empathy for this guy who you feel like is getting a raw deal. And then you find out he's actually a criminal. And then you're like, then you're conflicted because you're like, oh, I felt bad for this guy and he's awful. Right. Now I want him to get killed. But also like there's some trauma here and he's a good dad, but also like that's disgusting. <laughs> anyway, like it's like this is real want, things going on. Exactly. You want yeah. real things you want to dig in. And that's why, like, I don't think genre winds up mattering. Right. Like right. if you uh -huh. are willing yeah. to do the work, the genre work, watch a bunch of great movies in that genre, watch a bunch yeah. of shitty movies in that genre, do the work, do the research. You can write any genre if you're willing to learn the tropes, come up with a story, beat it out. But what you can bring to it, which would makes it part of your voice is your individuality, your belief system. Like, what is the audience walking away with at the end of it, no matter what you're writing about. And that's kind of what yeah. I've tried to do with myself and my own writing is like, 
if you put my scripts in a stack and you just look at the titles, you looked at what they were about, like simple, like AI written synopsis, you might be like, why is this guy writing all these different things? But I think like, hopefully what I've been able to do is like show people, no, like I'm not just writing about this stuff. It's always like kind of a comedic twist or, or like a, like darkly funny, maybe is a better way Mm -hmm. to put it twist on like what, I'm going through as a person and what I hope other people are also going through, which is like whether it's a desire for connection or recognition or just like enough money to get by or, you know, like um, I'm working on this movie right now, with Stallone's company, which is just like an action movie about uh, a hit woman who shows up at corporate headquarters because the whole system's fucked up. And she's like, this is stupid. I'm a, I had to be an unpaid intern and now I can't mm. get here and I don't qualify for your healthcare system, but I, but I do have to pay my dues and I have to do these sorts of things. Like, and it's an action movie, but it's really about like, I don't know. I don't know how old you are, but like, just like how f- like fucked the American like machine like, is. And like yeah. when you're a cog in it and you're trying to like, like work for a corporation, but also like, are you continually being screwed or held back? Or there's old people at the top that won't retire. So you can't get a raise. Or you can't get promoted. And your ideas are constantly shut down or you're dealing with like an HR person or whatever, like all those frustrations, but like, you know, couched in an action movie where like her solution is, you know, accidentally shooting her boss and then having to fight her way out, you know, like that sort yeah. of thing. But it's like, yeah, exactly. Like, the, mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. What am I going through? What am I doing? How does that, how is that a part of me? Like, what do I, how do I see the world? And I hope people when they read my stuff, at least can see the world through my eyes for like a little bit. Um, and I think that's what the, I'm just emulating the best writers out there. And that's what I think they do too. And, uh, you know, hopefully it doesn't always work for me, right? Not every spec is amazing and not every story connects that way, but I'm hoping through like rigorous rewriting, working with yeah. producers, working with directors, working with actors who have their own points of view. We can bring the stuff in and make good stuff that connects with people. Cause I think at the end of the day, like how did I get into movies? I really loved watching the ones that really moved me and, yeah. and helped shape my worldview. So now I'm hoping to pay it forward that way. Yeah. I love that. So, and also what you like brought to light is like the apparent, almost like the apparent story or whatever, like the genre, whatever, whatever. But then yeah. there's like the real story in there, you know, there's like, always a real really story. Then the best I, movies yeah. have something else they're trying to talk about. Even totally. like, you know, even the good, like Jurassic Park really is about like that Jeff Goldblum line of like, you were so busy trying to figure out if you could do it. You didn't stop to think if you should do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what that movie is. You know, like that's yeah. the moral of that story. You know? And I think like, the best stuff has that. And, and, you know, I'm always searching for like, how does it come out in my own writing and how do we make sure that's, you know, put it on front street for the audience and like, where are they yeah. going to take it? Yes. Oh, I love this. Okay. So I'll ask you a few random questions. Sure. Um, if you were a professional athlete, <laughs> what sport would you play? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, you know what? Like I, I, I think like in a dream world, I'd love to be like a, an NFL defensive end, you know, like I think uh, just not knocking <laughs> yeah. people around. But but in reality, uh, I get up many times a week and just play pickleball in L.A. with a bunch of oh, old people. So many and people I think play I, pickleball. I think yeah. I could smoke, you know, I'm smoking these old people. So maybe I uh, more likely Need could pickleball. be a professional pickleball player. Yeah. OK, what's your horoscope sign? And does that mean anything to you? <laughs> oh, uh, I'm a Gemini. It okay. doesn't really mean anything to me, although people always say I'm like, definitely they're like, oh, we could tell you're a Gemini. So um, yeah. I am obsessed with Astrology Zone, the okay. Susan Miller app. I a friend told me about it like a decade ago. And because it's like weirdly like Hollywood, you know, like she's always like, you might sell a screenplay or do whatever. Uh, like, no way. It's, I find it to be like this. <laughs> I'm like disgustingly one, into it because when it's good news, it's always like good news couched it like in Hollywood stuff. And yeah, there's so little hope out here that like yeah I'm, like, and if she has bad news i'm always like it's fucking it. this is bullshit yeah i can't believe i have this app but yeah okay cool and then this podcast is called behind the now but i always like to focus on um be the now so like how do you be the now and that's up to your interpretation oh <sighs> i think the world is changing so quickly now and and you know, if you asked me 10 years ago what being a Hollywood writer would be like, you know, I, I would have had some sort of stock answer. But I feel like every day now with the news and the like state of the world and just coming out of a pandemic and strike and different things, I, I think that people are losing focus on who, 
uh, at least in Hollywood, why we're all here. And we're here to tell stories. Um, and a lot of times people are f- forcing the message first or they're not putting mm. a message in at all. They're neutering it to make sure everyone watch at night. I think like if we go back to being in the now right now, at least for me, is going back to what storytelling is, which is like, why am I telling the story and why are people going to connect with it? And if there's a, you know, a universal message, I hope Hollywood hears, it's just that like listening to more diverse and interesting stories is only going mm-hmm. to help. And uh, for creators, writing from a place of what makes the audience entertained will it'll be much easier to get your message across later. So, you know, like right from what's the most entertaining thing and you'll find it. I don't think there's a better movie in the last 10 years probably than get out and get out. says a lot about what's going on in our world, but it's also, you know, one of the most entertaining movies that that's ever been made. And that's yeah. like, should be a guiding light probably to more people in Hollywood. And also uh, for me, when I sit down and, you know, I'll be rewriting a script after this is a podcast is over. Like that'll be the, at the forefront of my mind. How do I be part of the now in this? How I, how do I start from the seed of a story and continue mm-hmm. to make sure on every page it's entertaining. Uh, and then the rest of itself will figure itself out as, you know, by the time you turn type fade out. Okay. Jason, where can our listeners find you? Where can we find your work? Sure. Yeah. So I'm just at Jason Hellerman on Twitter and then at Jason Hellerman on Instagram. And then I have a website. It's just the Jason Hellerman.com because someone owns Jason Hellerman.com. I'm not uh, that full of myself. And that has a couple scripts on it. You can check out, you can email me through that website. If you have uh, other questions or you're a producer that wants to buy something, please feel free to reach out. But yeah, just at Jason Hellerman and all, across all platforms. And if you Google me, you'll find me. And um, I do some blog writing for No Film School and I'm on the No Film School podcast as well, which comes out all the time. So, you know, reach out, talk to me and, you know, I'm excited. And hopefully we're all making, you know, big, successful movies or TV shows together soon. Yeah. Okay. Incredible. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I've loved talking to you. You're yeah, this is a blast. Amazing. I really had a good time. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I'm your host, Jenna Malatsky, and this episode was edited by Jacob Mommen. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube at Jenna.Malatsky and on Spotify and Apple Podcasts at Behind the Now with Jenna Malatsky.